So you guys don't really look happy, even though the music is, is really happy. I have a confession to make with that song. What you saw there was like there's that slow part and then the end of a song by R.E.M. called Shiny Happy People. I have a confession to make. I never made it that far before changing the station or the video. <laughs> Until this week, as you know, it was spiritual research for finding something that would work for starting this week. But maybe you guys think with this series, Happy, I'm kind of stuck in a rut because there's this, uh, lots of songs out there that are happy that I've been playing. Some of them you may have liked, some of them you may not have liked, but maybe you think it's kind of, you know, we're kind of in a rut here, John. It's been four weeks of happy songs before the sermon and the, there's this message it's got this title happy but most weeks it's like not really making me happy at least not in my flesh to hear it and maybe you think I'm a little bit stuck in a rut and I thought I would start this message with that question have you ever been stuck in a rut have you ever been stuck in a rut? Come on now. We know what a rut is, right? So I, I've been getting stuck in ruts my entire life. I remember back when I was in school, I would get stuck in a rut. Maybe I'm sick or I just woke up stupid that day, but I ended up not going to school. So you miss a couple of assignments. And before long, you know, you don't catch those assignments up in time and you end up behind on everything. Maybe you didn't learn today what you needed to know for tomorrow. And before long, report card time comes and you realize that, oh, wow, this isn't as good as I thought it would be. I kind of got stuck in a rut. Or, or maybe it's happened to you at work where, um, you know, there's things that you knew you needed to get done. And if you're like me... I don't even have an office at the Florence Church. Part of why I don't have an office is I know I've got this problem. Maybe you've got this problem. Maybe you know people with this problem. Maybe you're married to someone with this problem. But whenever I have a desk, paper after paper after paper after paper after paper after paper, and everything becomes this big disorganized mess that unfortunately I know exactly where everything is but no one else does you see it's easy to get stuck in a rut or maybe you've been stuck in a rut with a relationship maybe in a marriage maybe a relationship with a family member there are some things you know you need to do you don't do them you end up stuck in a rut. And uh, what I'm going to draw right here is a rut. And just welcome to Bad Art with Pastor John. So this is a rut. As a matter of fact, because I'm going to save us time and I'm just going to go ahead and draw two of them right now. But we got these two ruts. And the two ruts, I, I want to talk about them for a moment. You see, these are places where we get stuck. And uh, at my old church, there was a, a little old lady. Her name was Mary. And she was late 70s, early 80s. I'm sure Mary Hutchins is still around, but she had this story. And what her theory was is, do you know what waits for us at the end of a rut? Anybody know what those are? If I wrote R-I-P, R-I-P. At the end of every rut, if we don't do something to get out of that rut, the place we end up with is death. You see, if I don't find some way to clean up that messy desk, at some point a hundred years from now, I'm going to die and Melissa's going to have to clean it up. At some point in school, if you don't get yourself out of that rut, the report card comes and maybe you're not as happy with that grade as you thought it would be. 
Maybe you're, at, maybe you're in a job and you've gotten caught in this rut where you always show up five minutes late for work every day or ten minutes late for work every day. And it's time for the review to come and you go before your boss and you're wondering, why is that raise not quite as big as I thought it would be? Hey, I'm the hardest worker around here, but unfortunately you'd gotten stuck in this rut of showing up for work five minutes late every day. Or maybe there's a promotion that comes and somebody needs to get put to management and you're the natural choice. But you get passed over for that promotion because they wonder, well, if they can't get here on time, even as just one of the normal employees, will they be able to get here on time if they're the manager. And so that promotion dies, that grade dies, and eventually it leads to death. And that's all well and good when we're talking about life. You know, it happens, we move on. But Jesus, in this message series we've been going through, Happy, in the Sermon on the Mount, talks about a rut that's far more important than what we would get caught in in our relationships here on earth, in our relationships um, with our spouses even, and our families, in school or work. Jesus talks about there's a couple of ruts that you can get caught in and we're going to read a couple of verses out of Matthew chapter 5. You remember last week if you were here, that's awesome. We read through the first 10 verses. They're called the Beatitudes. Blessed is the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are you guys. So go home, do some homework, review that, or come next week. We'll read through them again because we're going to be doing a, 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 a message next week that is back to the Beatitudes. But we're going to skip down a few verses this week and we're going to read a few verses of why the Beatitudes are there. And we're going to start, let's read together. So, there, there's two ruts here. I'm going to point to them after we've read, okay? Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophet. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. So why did Jesus come? And why is he here? Why is he giving that message to the disciples that day on the mountain so many years ago? To accomplish the purpose of the writings of, of the prophets and the law of Moses. He's there to accomplish the purpose. Okay, so as a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and write this rut. So don't misunderstand why I have come but I've come to accomplish the purpose of the writings of Moses and of the prophets. So I'm going to write in this rut, law. You could also throw parentheses in there and write legalism. I just didn't want to misspell that, so I just write law because I can spell that. Okay? So let's read. Let's read on. And then he says, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So he's telling us that not even the smallest detail of God's law is going to disappear until its purpose is achieved. So he's still talking about the purpose of the law, right? Let's read this. This is really important. So if you ignore the least commandment, and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So he's identified these two ruts. So this one is law, and this one is lawless. So law and lawless. This one says the way to know God is by following the system of rules. Do this, don't do that, 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 don't do that. And you guys know what all these are, right? 
You guys, you guys have learned these from as, as young as you could have been taught, you know? Don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, don't hit your brother, don't, don't do all these things, don't, don't hate, don't, don't, don't. Hopefully you've been taught these things your whole life. Hopefully you've been taught to do good. But the problem is, is that we get taught this thinking that it's the way to God. But there's this other side of it. You see, there's this other side of it because we come to Jesus and he's teaching us about grace and mercy. He's teaching us about the love of God. And it's easy if you listen to Jesus and don't catch the fool of what he's saying. If you just pick this verse out and you pick that verse out, you think you can live any old way you want. You see, you think God is cool, that he's okay with my sin, that I can live any way I want. And you know what? Yeah, I might have stole that, but I had a good reason. God knows my heart. I didn't tell the whole truth there, but God knows my heart. I didn't give what I was supposed to give, but I gave, you know. God knows my heart. And we get in this thing of lawless. We end up on the other side of the fence from this thing of rules to this thing of no rules. We end up redefining God. And I wonder, what about this next verse? We're going to read verse 20. You see, there were some people that was in that crowd with Jesus. There were some people who wanted to trip Jesus up and, and make people think that, uh, that Jesus was lawless. That Jesus was okay with our sins. That Jesus was teaching his people, do whatever you want, what God says don't matter. But that's what, not what Jesus was teaching at all. You see, Jesus came to fulfill the purpose. Jesus came to fulfill the purpose of the law. Jesus came to fulfill, fulfill the purpose of the rules. Jesus came to fulfill the purpose. So this next verse is really scary. The first time I read it, it scared me to death. It's really scary. Let's read it out loud. Jesus says, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. See, the Pharisees, they were stuck in that rut. They were stuck in that rut. And Jesus came to deliver us from that religious rut. That the only way we're going to get to God is to try and live a perfect life. Because I don't know how many of you have tried to live a perfect life, but I have and failed miserably. And I think we all fail miserably trying to be perfect in our own actions. It's, it's like, it's impossible to do in human strength. And Jesus came to deliver us from that. But in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is trying to tell us, don't trade one rut for another rut. Because they are both ruts, and they both lead to death. Either way you go, only law or lawless, they both lead to death. So we're going to read on. And I'm just going to read this verse 17 again. And don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. And their purpose is that we would be happy. Happy not according to what your friends say is happy. Because most of them, they have a smile on their face and a lot of pain inside. Almost all of them. Not happy according to what maybe some people define as success. You know, if you've got a lot of money or you've got a lot of things or your boat's bigger or your car is nicer or whatever it is that you like. Not happy according to that, but happy according to Jesus. And happy according to the purpose for which the law and the prophets were given. Does anybody want to know the purpose? Anybody, have you ever thought about what is the purpose? 
I want you to dial your head back. Now, if you've been in church a long time, you're going to know where I'm about to go. If you're new to church and you're not a student of the Bible, it's okay. I'm, I'm going to invite you on a journey, and I'm going to start here. There, there were some people, they were called the children of Israel. They were, um, they were children of the children of the children of Israel, actually. There was this guy, his name was Jacob. His granddaddy was Abraham. He had a lot of promises that God made to him. And he said through him, through his family, the entire world would be blessed. And these children had ended up in Egypt for 400 years. And the problem that they had when they were in Egypt is, number one, Egypt wasn't the land that God had promised them. But number two, they had ended up becoming slaves in this land. They had worked their tails off day after day after day after day their entire life so that somebody they don't know could get an inheritance that they worked for but didn't belong to them. So they lived as slaves and they, day after day they would cry out to God, 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 get us out of this. God, when are you going to deliver your people? God, when are you going to when are you going to remember the promises that you made to my great 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 granddad? You said we'd be blessed. We don't feel blessed. We're slaves. When are you going to get us out of here? So God raised up a deliverer. Does anybody remember the deliverer's name? Moses. Yeah, somebody's read the Bible here. Pat yourself on the back. Go. Like yeah. Moses. So God raised up a deliverer. His name is Moses. Has anyone ever heard of Moses? Most of us have heard of Moses, okay? So Moses actually grows up in the palace. He grows up as the grandson of Pharaoh, who is the equivalent of king. He's, just, he's the king. They call him Pharaoh. It's a different name. It's a different culture. But, so he grows up in royalty, But he's a Hebrew. He's one of the children of Israel. So while everybody else is slaving away, he's sitting in air conditioning and having some servant feed him grapes or whatever it is that royal people do. I'm not sure. I've never been one. But um, so he's in this palace, but he ends up throwing it all away because he can't stand seeing his people in this state. And he ends up getting kicked out of Egypt or running from Egypt because he murders someone, and it's a long story. But he has this encounter with God 40 years later at this bush that's burning, and he experiences the presence and the glory of God. And God tells him that he needs to go to Pharaoh, and he's supposed to tell Pharaoh to let let my people go. You guys, you've been, reading, you've been reading your Bibles. You learned this in Sunday school, didn't you? All right, so. Why did God want to deliver them from slavery? Do you remember what he said? Let my people go so that they can. Most people have this thought. God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt so he could lead them into the promised land. That's what most people think. But is that what the Bible says? See, if you don't know this story, then you're probably at a right spot right now so you can learn it right the first time. Because God did not deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt so that they could enter the promised land. That was not the reason. This is the reason. Let's, let's read this verse. Then This is God talking to Moses. Then announced to him, Pharaoh, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. So they can worship me in the wilderness. So why did God deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt? So they could worship him in the wilderness. And here is the problem. The children of Israel got delivered out of Egypt. There was, it's a long story. There's a lot of 
plagues and death and carnage and things that happened and I don't have time to go through all that stuff and there was a Red Sea that parted and they crossed and they ended up in this wilderness and the only problem was is God had led them out there to worship in the wilderness but they got to the wilderness and they were not happy. All they ever did was complain. As a matter of fact, they said over and over again, why in the world did you bring us out to this wilderness? We should have stayed in Egypt. And here's the part that blows my mind. Is the children of Israel were raised in slavery. They were beaten with whips and forced to work. They never had anything that was their own, but everything even that they had, it wasn't yours. It still belonged to Pharaoh, and he could come and take it at any time. And and they lived under oppression, and they lived under an iron fist, and they all wanted to go back. But Moses, Moses grew up in the palace with air conditioning, with servants feeding him grapes, bathed in oil, whatever it is that these royal families get to do. And never once, not once in the whole Bible, not one time, did Moses ever come to God and say, I should have stayed in Egypt. What's the difference? See, when Moses got his opportunities to meet face to face with God, to experience God's glory, Moses stepped in. But when the children of Israel got their opportunity to do what they were created to do, to do what the purpose of being led into that wilderness was, when they had a chance to encounter the glory of God, they stepped back. They step back. So, don't misunderstand why I have come. I have come to accomplish its purpose. So, I'm going to read a little bit. This, we're going to pick it up in Exodus chapter 19. There's a whole lot of stuff that's happened. I'm going to hit a message in the month of July that's going to talk about the prequel to this message. But for today, we're just going to skip all that so that we can move along. Exodus 19, verse 3, they've been, in the, they've been in the wilderness for two months. Okay? And you don't have to read with me, I'll just read it. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called him to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Whenever you see that word Jacob and Israel, they're used interchangeably. God changed Jacob's name to Israel and He's called by both in the Bible. So the children of, children of Israel, family of Jacob, same people. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. See, even God says it. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if. Can somebody say if? If. If. You know, there's a lot of promises from God that are contingent upon one little two-letter word that'll make you either be able to receive it or not be able to receive it, if. That word if is a really huge deal. As a matter of fact, that word if, Jesus said, you are my friends if you obey my commandments. Why do you call, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? That word if is so big, and it hasn't changed just because there's a new covenant, just because there's a new testament. That word if didn't change. God didn't change. God's the same. Now, if you will obey me and might keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Let's read that out loud, the yellow part. And you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Now, is God saying this to Moses or is he saying this to all the children of Israel? 
Is he saying it just to a special class? Or is he saying it to all of the children of Israel? Is he saying it to Pastor John? Or is he saying it to all of the Florence church? He's saying it to everyone. He wants us to be a kingdom of priests. He wants to put a crown upon our head, a crown of his favor, a crown of life, a crown of hope. You will be my kingdom of priests. What do priests do? You see, when we think of the priest, if you think in an Old Testament form, the priest goes into the presence of God. But this is before that happened. We're going to read why in the world there came these two segments of society, those who are holy and those who are common, those who are pastors and those who are in the pews, those who are godly and the rest of us. You'll be my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. And all the people responded together. Read out loud, yellow. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. They're excited to hear it. They've seen all of God's miracles. God's talking about he's going to have this special favor upon them. They're looking for everything that God can do for them. And, And they're happy to do all that the Lord has commanded And so Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. You would think they're finally on the road to happy. They they finally taken that step to happy. They finally let the, the words of their mouth have declared the things of happy. But let's watch what happens. See, what happens is Moses goes up on the mountain. And he reports to God that the people said, yes, we want to do everything you obey. Yes, we want to follow you. Yes, we want to inherit your special treasure upon the earth. We want all the things that you can do for us. And God starts to come down and reveal his glory. And when God's presence comes down from that mountain, there's thunder and there's lightning and the earth shakes and it begins to quake and we're going to pick it up there. And when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke blowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance. So God's coming down from the mountain. Remember what I said? When Moses had an opportunity to encounter God, Moses stepped in. But when the people had an opportunity to encounter God, the people stepped back. Trembling with fear. Trembling. They were scared of God. I'm going to read on. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. Moses knew this was devastating news. This is not why God brought them into the wilderness. And if you're in, out here in this congregation, And you're looking for God to speak to Pastor John so that he can tell you something that God said. I want to tell you that that is not the purpose that Jesus came. He came to make you a kingdom of priests. So that you would have access to God. That nothing stands between you and God except for Jesus Christ, who we have put our faith and our trust in. And when we put our faith and our trust in him, we have direct access to God. And Moses, the next verse, it says, Don't be afraid. Moses answered them, 
For God has come in this way to test you, so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. What? Am I the only one that 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 sentence is really confusing to? Don't be afraid, so that your fear of him. Don't be afraid, so that your fear. Doesn't it sound like he's telling you to not be afraid and be afraid in the same sentence? Maybe there's something different with Hebrew language than English, but in English this is very confusing. Or maybe there is something that we're missing. Something that's really, really important. You see, God wants us to learn the difference between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. See, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is what we need in this life. What you and what me and most everybody I know is missing in our lives is the fear of the Lord. What we're missing is, you see, we think we will live in this state of lawlessness, doing whatever we think is right in our own eyes and thinking that God blesses it. But what we really are is we are stuck in this rut and thinking we're on a path to life, but it's never going to bring us the life like Jesus died so that we could have because we don't have the fear of the Lord. And I'm going to show you why in just a moment. And until you know the fear of the Lord, you see the fear of the Lord will keep you out of either one of these ditches. I think of, when I think of those ruts, those ditches leading to death, the first picture I had in my mind was, um, this was my first year of driving on Ohio roads, and maybe you guys have been on them your whole life, but for the rest of us in the, the world, these eight foot deep ditches on either side of a snowy road is a pretty scary thing. <laughs> and more than a dozen times, I said to my wife, I'm sure glad you bought, talked me into buying this Jeep. <laughs> Because going 40 miles an hour in that ditch on the side of the road, if you end up either way off, it's going to lead probably to death. As a matter of fact, having grown up here, many of you probably know somebody who may have died in one of those ditches. Probably know exactly what I'm talking about. The fear of the Lord is meant to keep us out of the ditch so that we don't fall into either one of those ruts, depending upon rules as our relationship with God, or just no rules. Everything's good. It doesn't matter. I can live any way. It doesn't matter that the Bible says that I need to live this way. I'll live how I want to, and God's going to be fine with it. I know God. And as the people stood in the distance... Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. You see, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Who do you tell your secrets to? Your friends, right? That that secret that no one else knows Yeah, she knows them all. You know why? She knows them best. My wife right there knows me in ways that people in this room never will. She knows me as what I am as a father. She knows me as what I am as a husband. She knows me intimately. She knows the things that get on my nerves. She knows the things that make me laugh. No one knows me better than her. She is my best friend. She knows every secret. She knows everything I ever struggled with. Those that fear the Lord know Him like that. They don't live in either one of these ruts. They're outside of the rut. The psalmist said it like this in Psalm 25, 14. 
The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. His covenant is his promises to us. You see, the fear of the Lord is the starting place for knowing God intimately. You see, this Psalm 25, 14 is one of those verses. Have you ever seen a verse in the Bible that's translated in ways that it's like really different depending on which version of the Bible you look at? There are lots of verses in the Bible that say about the same thing without a we for art thou. But this is one of those that actually use different words that give me a different meaning, and it's because the words in Hebrew aren't words in English, so the translators are trying to help us understand what the Hebrew writer meant. And there's so much meaning within these words. So this same verse is translated like this in the New, in the New Living Translation. The Lord is a friend to those who fear them, fear him. He teaches them his covenant. And still another version of the Bible translates it like this. Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. But but I think we're getting getting the gist of it by looking at all the different translations, right? The ones who fear the Lord know his secret. They know his ways. They know his covenant. The difference between the children of Israel and and Moses was this. The children of Israel knew God's deeds. They saw him part the Red Sea. They saw what happened on Passover. They saw the plagues. They saw all these things that God had done to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt. They, They knew God's deeds. But Moses knew God. Moses knew God's ways. And that is the place that God is calling us to. See, what happens when, why is it that the people backed up? Why is it that people backed up instead of going in to learn God? See, here's what I believe. We can see God's deeds and still live any way we want. We can have our own opinions on sin. We can be that, say, well, I do this and this, but I'm a good person. God knows my heart. Haven't we all been there at one time or another? Haven't we all been there in one area or another? Knowing what God says, but... I'm not trying to hear that right now. See, in God's presence, and God's holiness, there is no lawlessness. And what happens if we try to live that way? We find, so, the next thing that comes is after the people stand back and tell Moses to go back on the mountain, he goes up there And he comes back with the law, the Ten Commandments, and a bunch of other rules. Rules after rules after rules after rules. And all they feel is this rut. And then something really strange happens. After all the rules are given, Moses goes back up on the mountain. And let's pick this up in chapter 32, chapters and chapters and chapters later. 32 verse 1, And when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. Make us some gods who can lead us. Wait a minute. Gods? How is he supposed to go make them gods? Isn't God the one who led them out of Egypt? That word gods is the word Elohim. Actually, actually I believe that the translator got a little, um, maybe scared there. The word Elohim is used 2,200 and some odd times in the Bible. 
2,000 of those times it refers to God, and the other couple hundred times it refers to fake gods like Baal or some of the other fake gods. But they said, make us gods who can lead us. And then the next verse, We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. And so Aaron said, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. And then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you, gods again, that's Elohim, out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf, and then he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Now that word Lord is the word Yahweh. Yahweh was so sacred to the people of Israel that they wouldn't even use the vowels when they spelled it. Yahweh, 100% of the time, every time that it's used in the Bible, always refers to the Lord our God. It never, ever, ever refers to anyone but the Lord our God. That is God's name. It's a name that's above every other name. And so here they are, and they're in front of this calf, and they're going to... A golden calf? So they're, they're in this state of lawlessness, and um, let's see. I didn't have a yellow uh, marker, so I'm just going to draw the golden calf in black. But a festival to Yahweh in front of this golden calf? How can it be? How can it be? After they saw the mighty hand of God deliver them from the hand of Egypt, how can they make a, a, a god out of gold and say that's who delivered us from the hand of Egypt. How can they do that? Aaron was actually supposed to go on the mountain with Moses. When God, when the people stepped back, God said, tell Aaron to come up here on the mountain with you and we're going we're gonna to do this different because they won't come. Because they didn't want God to see their sin. They didn't want to change the way they lived. They didn't want to get out of that ditch. But Aaron didn't want to go either. And what Aaron did was he grew up in this society in Egypt. Aaron grew up in this society in Egypt where the Egyptians worshipped these images. Snakes, and cattle, and all. There were many, many, many gods. So when Aaron was trying to make an image of Yahweh, he made an image of a calf. It says he molded it. And God's on the mountain and he says to Moses, he says, get down there now. The children of Israel, they've perverted, they've perverted everything. They're destroying everything. You've got to get down there now. And Moses comes down from the mountain and finally he turned to Aaron and demanded, what did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Don't get, up, don't get so upset, my Lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. And when they, when they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and out came this calf. He told a bold-faced lie. He said, I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. It just says earlier in the other scripture that he molded it into the shape of that calf. Another another version, the King James says he engraved it into the shape of a calf. But he says, "Eh, I threw it in the fire and a cow came out. What happened was Aaron was creating an image of God based upon his own ideas of what God was. And if we do that, we're going to find ourselves stuck in a rut 
that does not lead to life. And Jesus is trying to keep us out of that rut. I, I wrote it a really fancy way up here. You'll want to fill in the blanks. But it's, this is the, the essence of it. Is if we do not spend time in the presence of God, our image of God will be shaped by the world. Our image of God will be shaped by the world. The world who tells us that we can do whatever we want. That we don't have to worry about what God says. But that's not what God, that's not what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' words, and we're going to close right here. Let's read this out loud together. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide. For the many choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult. And only a few will ever find it. The road to happy is a little space on a narrow road out of the ditch of lawlessness and out of the ditch of religion. It's about having a relationship with God. And it takes time in the presence of God to find it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. God, I come confessing. Confessing that there are things within my life and the lives of your people even here in this church and all over where we have made an image of you that isn't necessarily you, God. And I just pray that you would bring us all out of that ditch and help us find holiness and righteousness not based upon trying to follow rules, but a desire to be in your presence, a desire to experience your glory, a heart that wants to know you intimately, that we would know the fear of the Lord to keep us out of the ditch so that we can be in your presence, so that we can hear the secrets, so that you can reveal your covenant, so you can reveal your plans, so that we would know your hope, that we would know your life intimately. God, we don't want to be like a woman who marries a man just because he's got a lot of money. We don't want to be a people who come to God just because we're looking for a blessing or we're looking for what you can do for us. No, we want to love you for real, Lord. For who you really are. Not for an image that we have made you out to be. And it's only by your grace we can get there. So I ask that once again you would invite us in. Invite us into that narrow road, to that narrow pathway. That we might know you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.